Church, grab your Bibles tonight and turn. I can't believe I'm going to say it. So excited. Turn to Isaiah chapter 60. Chapter 60. It's amazing. This is a big deal. It's taken us four years to get here. And um, Isaiah chapter 60, heading out, of course, to chapter 66, the end of the book. From this time on, um, think of this. From this time on, it gets technicolor. It gets extremely descriptive of what is coming and what God is going to do. And it's an amazing thing to keep in mind. Listen, Christian tonight, if you don't know this, revel in it. For those of us who know this, we take comfort in this, that our God is sovereign and the Bible uh, has never failed yet in what it has described, nor shall it ever fail. It is God's word, it is inerrant, and God's truth will prevail. And you need to remember that as we get into these portions of scripture because you're going to hear about the future, and Isaiah is writing this, remember, nearly 3,000 years ago. He is one of the most beloved prophets to the Jewish people and certainly to Christians throughout the millennia. And Isaiah chapter 60 is going to be a chapter that is themed up with really a, a question. And if you're a note taker tonight, you can write that down. And the question is this, can the Lord restore you? Isaiah chapter 60 all the way through to the end is going to be about God restoring. Can I say this? Everything. He's going to, of course, dial down on Israel because the Bible says he's going to restore Israel to the glory that was promised to her, God's people. He's going to restore the earth during the millennial reign of Christ. That's the thousand-year reign of Christ, which, by the way, you know this by now, Jesus Christ must rule and reign from Jerusalem, not Toronto, not Washington, D.C., not Chile. He's got to rule and reign from Jerusalem, so much so the Bible is so elaborate on that fact that if Jesus Christ doesn't rule from Jerusalem, then you and I have worshipped the wrong Jesus all these years with 2,000 years of worshipers included. Then we would have missed him. That's how important the return of Christ is. And Isaiah chapter 60 is beginning to lay that out in a very colorful manner. And you think about this, by the way, as we get into this in the, in the, the title about you, I, us being restored, and the question is, can God restore you? It's funny how we think as humans. Either, number one, our mind swings to one end, and we are so self-reliant and so proud and so self-assured that we don't need God, people think. In fact, people who think like that, um, they think that people who need God, they're weak or they need a crutch. Have you ever had somebody remind you of that? I've had people tell me that in my lifetime. Oh, you know what? Oh, you're a believer in God. Oh, well, everybody needs a crutch. Well... What's your crutch if you don't believe in Jesus? If, if, if you don't have the word of God as your foundation and promise, what do you believe in? And by the way, Jesus is not my crutch. He's my wheelchair. He's my therapy center. He's my entire hospital. He's my everything. And so the proud people, the proud would, would say, well, religion, that's good for you. Jesus, that's good for you. Um, if you need that, more power to you. I don't need that. Wow, really? That's amazing. And then the pendulum swings to the other side, which is equally wrong, to where the point you, you see yourself so, uh, so bad, so wicked, so unredeemable that you think others can be saved, but not you. And so the human psyche swings from one end to the other. Both are wrong. Both are wrong. If you're proud, you need to repent and get away from that sin and come to Christ. And if you're on the other end where you see yourself outside the saving power of God and the power of his blood, you need to repent and you need to come to Christ. Because he's mighty to save. And you're going to hear a lot about his salvation from here on out in the closing of the book. But it's an amazing thing to realize that God is a God of restoration. And Isaiah chapter 60, as I said a moment ago, is all summed up. Look ahead, by the way. Look down to verse 16. 
You ought to circle it and highlight it because it's the very theme verse of the chapter. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 16 says, You shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior. Notice, he's the Lord and Savior. He says, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Jacob's another name for Israel. But listen, you're going to learn uh, very quickly that this one who is the Lord, he's the Savior, he's the Redeemer, he's the Mighty One of Jacob, he's the one that saves all those who will come to him. And the great thing about tonight in this message that God can restore you is the fact that every one of us need a touch from God in our lives. We need God's touch to restore us. And when we think about the chronology of chapter 60, Bible students, mark this down if you've taken notes, that in Isaiah chapter 60 now begins a chronology of end time events that Isaiah is looking at. By the way, when I say looking at, remember this. In the opening study of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah says, these are visions that God gave me. That is Isaiah. Isaiah saw visions. He didn't see uh, words appear on a scroll. He wrote down, imagine this. He is seeing things uh, superimposed upon his reality. He is in his element. He's in his place. And somehow before him, was it visually revealed in front of him? Did he see it in his mind? But they were visions. And he wrote down what he saw. And we have been studying these visions from chapter to chapter. And so in this particular verse 16, God is saying, I'm the Lord. I'm the Savior. I'm the Redeemer. I'm the Mighty One. Church, this is important for us because all of us need to have that kind of strength spoken to us regarding our restoration. God wants your life restored. He wants your life renewed. Better than even renewal. When we talk about restoration, I like to think of restoration in the sense of resurrection. According to the Bible, you and I are dead apart from Christ in our sins. But God makes us alive. And he does that by his mighty word that goes forth. Listen, I'm going to give you five things that you ought to write down by way of introduction. And then as we get into this, that when we talk about the chronology from chapter 60 to 66, number one, as we look at chapter 60 tonight, you're going to be learning about the second coming of Jesus Christ to earth. And that's found in the book of Revelation chapter one, of course, and Isaiah chapter 63. So you're going to see the second coming of Christ to earth. That's important in Isaiah 60. Number two, you're going to hear about the remnant of Israel having survived the great tribulation period. Out of the seven-year tribulation period that is yet to come, Israel, a remnant, will survive. And you can read about that in Revelation 19. The third thing that we're going to learn in this chapter is that there's the surviving nations that become a shelter to Israel during that tribulation period. That's found in Matthew chapter 28. Nations. There will be nations that will be judged before God and they will be approved by how they treated the Jewish people during the seven-year tribulation period. Again, that's Matthew chapter 25 regarding the separation of the nations. The Bible says that Jesus, when he comes back, will separate, as it were, the sheep from the goats. That's nations, not sheep and goats, not believers from unbelievers. It's the separation of nations, and the criteria is how the nations treated Israel in the tribulation period. It's important to know that. You're going to learn tonight, fourthly, that the throne of David is the established location of Jesus' throne. Listen, Jesus is seated tonight. Are you guys listening? Jesus is seated tonight at the right hand of God the Father. Book of Acts chapter 7 tells us this, among other passages. Jesus has never sat upon the throne of David. The Old Testament promises that the Messiah must sit on the throne of David. Jesus has never sat on the throne of David. Not yet. The throne of David is in Jerusalem. That's why, by the way, Jesus is called the son of David. There has to be the fulfillment of the promise that came from God to David that from his DNA, that from his genealogy would come the Messiah and he would sit upon the throne of David to establish it forever. 
right? Think of that. That's going to be here. And then also, number five, we'll see that there are hints of a post-millennial eternal age that is known in the Bible as the day of God. It's in 2 Peter chapter 3, that after the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, are you guys confused? Yes, some say yes. We're going through the chronology. You should have written those five things down. That at the end, there's at the end of the millennium, all that is physical is dissolved and gone away. And the Bible calls it the day of God where you and I will be, listen, you and I will be in that state of what is actually referred to as eternity. God dwells in eternity. But after the millennium where Christ is on earth seated upon the throne of David and exercising his government over the earth, when that time expires at the end of a thousand years, then this earth is all done away. Can you imagine? It's all going to be dissolved, the Bible says. And the day of God begins, which is, listen, which is all eternity for us. It's when we enter into this eternal realm and all that is of this world and of this universe is gone. So the first thing we see tonight regarding can the Lord restore you, and you ought to be asking yourself that question, is found in verses 1 to 14, and it's this. Israel is God's example of renewal. Will you write that down? Why Israel? Why is Israel so important? Why is Israel in the Bible so much? What, what does it matter? It matters everything, church. Please mark this down for this reason. More and more churches, more and more Christians today are writing Israel off. They're listening to uh, liberal preaching and, and manipulation of the Bible to say, oh, the Jew is no longer relevant. Israel's not relevant. In fact, today, Israel is an illegitimate government. The land is not theirs. It's all symbolic language. It's all now, it's really spiritualized and it's about the church. Listen, you do that and you completely, completely not only mess up the Bible for yourself, but you have no confidence in any scripture whatsoever if you begin to manipulate the Bible like that. Let the Bible say exactly what it says. And when God says, I've made an eternal, everlasting covenant with Israel, guess what that means? Exactly that. Exactly. Well, no, you know, they, they, they were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. They lost all of those privileges. Where'd you get that from? Where'd you get that from? The book of Romans tells you clearly from chapters 9, 10, and 11 that God has not cast Israel off forever, but for a period of time he has set them off to the side until the fullness of the Gentiles, that is, the number of Gentiles known only to God is complete, and then God will restore the nation of Israel, and it all begins, if you know your Bible prophecy study, it all begins at some period of time after the rapture of the church. When the church is taken up and off the earth, then God focuses his single attention on the nation of Israel and restores them. So when God restores or renews Israel, it is absolutely vital. Look at verse 1. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. God is speaking to the nation of Israel. This is prophetic. This is coming. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now look at verse 2, and I'll explain it in a moment. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the deep darkness uh, the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Verse 1 announces that God is going to do this enlightening work. God is going to do this restoration work. When will he do it? That's verse 2. When the world, when Israel, when there is darkness upon the land, when there is sin, when things look so hopeless, God is going to resurrect, God is going to bring his people back into his covenant relationship. Right now, they're away from him. Even though they've been gathered together and have been coming together physically since 1948, Israel as a nation has come into being for the second time in the history of man. They have not yet turned their eyes to Christ as they will. There will be a remnant of Jews that will be saved out of that. God says it's going to happen at a very dark period of time. And you think about the tribulation period. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It is going to be a horrific time. But note this. The seven years that God speaks about that he deals with the nation Israel, it has to be done as he has prescribed in Daniel chapter 9. 
Seven years, God will deal specifically with the nation of Israel. The world will be greatly affected as he focuses on his people and he will reveal himself. He will deliver them from the tyranny of the Antichrist and he will eventually come back, of course, in the second coming, all to bring about renewal. God has given them promises that he will fulfill. Church, does that mean that God will keep his promises made to you in the Bible? He has to. I said what I'm about to say many years ago at a conference, and I had a conference teacher. In fact, he, pulled, he was here last Sunday, by the way. About 20 years ago, I was speaking at a conference, and I said what I'm about to say, and it shocked him. And he told me, he goes, that shocked me. And I said that if God does not keep his promises to the nation of Israel and to the Jewish people, God is not obligated to keep any New Testament promise to you, the believer. If he breaks his covenant promise with Israel, then he can break his covenant promise with you, the believer. And I just went on and I was teaching and afterwards, Dr. David Hawking pulled me off to the side and he said, I've never heard that before. That's absolutely true. And you think about that. So if David Hawking had never heard it before, then it must have been from God. <laughs> but um, that's true. You can take that to the bank. Why? What's it based upon? God's ability to fulfill what he has said. He will never let you down. And if anyone will come to him, he will restore them. Don't be too proud and don't see yourself unredeemable. He will restore you. By the way, the word arise in verse 1. Kum is the Hebrew word and it means to stand to your feet with your eyes wide open. Look at that. Stand to your feet with your eyes wide open. Shine for your light has come. What a great announcement. By the way, again, from the beginning, God's people, he has, he has sovereignly chosen Israel to be his people. And if you're a skeptic in the house tonight, you ought to think about that. Why Israel? Why Israel? Why all this history of Israel? Why all the drama with Israel? Why is it every generation the Jew is the most persecuted people on the face of the earth? Always. Satan hates them. God loves them. They're very stubborn people. And God said, you're a very stubborn people. And I believe personally he picked Israel because he sends a message to us that if God can save a Jew, he can save anybody. And God can save a Jew. Ask Paul the Apostle. In fact, he said in the Old Testament, don't think I picked you because you're special than all the other nations of the earth. You're not special, he said that way. He said, I picked you. You're a stiff-necked people. Why would God do that? To show the rest of the world that you can be restored too. Well, Pastor Jack, I've gone from marriage to marriage or relationship to I've got, I've gone up, I've gone down. I've been in, I've been out. This has happened, that's happened. It's all. He can restore you. He can restore you. There's nothing that he cannot repair in your life. He's so good. His invitation goes out to his people. And here's this grand and glorious announcement of Israel. Your light is going to shine Someday. In Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says there, Paul writes, and he says in Romans 9, verse 4, to whom Israelite pertains the adoption. Listen to this. To Israelites, to the Jews, pertains the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law. God gave the law to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. The service of God and the promises. God gave them to the Jews first. Of whom are the fathers... And from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, look at this, who is over all the eternal blessed God. Amen. Y'all see that? That, first of all, this is not part of the Bible study, but look at the closing end of verse 5. That is a radical statement regarding the deity of Jesus Christ. Look at it. Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. It gets no, no, no clearer than that right there. But the, but the message that's being announced is the fact that from Israel came to us the very scriptures. You and I have the Bible tonight because the Jews were meticulous copiers of God's word. Did you know that? Right here. And from them, the, the promises come to us. 
Think of it. God will restore them. So you be careful. If you go uh, traffic around Christians or a church that says, no, no, what God's done with the Jews. Yikes. Not according to God, he's not. God's promises will never fail. Verse 3, the Gentiles shall come to your light. You guys should go, you should, ooh, wow. So what, is that, what does this mean? The Gentiles. How many of you are non-Jews? You're non-Jews, raise your hand. Non-Jews? Okay. That, that, hey, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps right now because this verse I shared with a friend in Israel, a Jew, a practicing Jew, who could not understand, he told me, he said, I don't get why you know our Bible so well. And you're a Gentile. And I said, it's your Hebrew scriptures that announces to me that God saves the Gentiles. He says, I've never heard of this. God saves Gentiles? Yes, book of Isaiah, chapter 60, right here in this verse. It's absolutely awesome. It says right here that the Gentiles, we Gentiles, shall come to your light. If it's a reference to salvation. The Gentiles will be saved by the going forth of the gospel in Israel. Listen, 2,000 years ago was supposed to be the custodian of the gospel to the world. They didn't receive the gospel. God knew this, prophesied this. Israel was put off to the side. The church was born. The gospel went to the ends of the earth via the Gentile church. Now we're at the end of that game, of that run, and God is about ready again to dial down on the nation of Israel. The church age is just about up. And God will now use the Jew. Have you read the book of Revelation lately? The Bible says 144,000 Jews, not Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> Sorry if you're J-Dub, the Bible says the 144,000 are Jews, they're men, they're virgins, they speak Hebrew, apparently they're able to speak any language, and they preach to the world, and the fruit of their preaching is a number of people, Gentiles saved, so great, John said, nobody can even count them. They're beyond counting. When does that happen? The tribulation period. How does that happen? Through... Israel, the Jew, being the witness, the evangelist, all promised by God. God's not done with the Jews. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising, as Israel is established by the restoration of God. Verse 4, lift up your eyes all around and see that all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar. And your daughters shall be nursed at your side. This is absolutely awesome. Again, remember this, everybody. To you and I, this is common. Isaiah said this in a time looking out beyond the horizon that there'll be a day at the end. This, has, this is not the Babylonian restoration. This is not the Persian, the Medo-Persian restoration of the Jew. Nope, this is beyond the horizon. Isaiah is casting, as it were, his view. And in the end, in the last days, when the Gentiles are coming to the salvation of God and the Jews are the vehicle by which the gospel is being preached, the announcement is made that what God will do with the nation is that he will assemble them from the ends of the earth. God will bring back his people. I have this question for you. Out of all the peoples of the earth, out of all the countries of the world, there's only one that is famous for a phenomenon that has been taking place since 1895. And that is the Jew around the world who has woken up in Argentina or in the United States or in Canada or in China and they've said, you know what, um, I'm going to move to Israel. Did you know that? It's a documented fact. And they have moved. In fact, I don't... Look, you and I have been alive when Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Remember that? And the breakup of the Soviet empire. I'm sure that was done for a lot of reasons. Number one on the list. Over 600,000 Russian-born Jews, when that happened at the decree of Reagan, moved to Israel. Fulfillment of scripture. And that's going to increase. That's going to continue. God's going to keep doing that. 
He's got such an awesome heart of restoration. Please, please, friend, no matter what you've gone through in your life, don't write yourself off. You are not beyond the cleansing, restorative power of God. Okay? Oh, Jack, I don't think there's any hope for me. Stop it. Just stop thinking like that. That's, that's dark, satanic thought. And that's not you. You rebuke that in the name of Jesus. You bring that thought under the captivity of Christ. And like we said last Sunday, you preach to yourself the gospel of God. And listen, some of us, we might need to remind ourselves of the gospel every day. You just remember that. You've not gone too far. Look at verse 5. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy. Because of the abundance of the sea, most scholars understand it to be the abundance of the merchants. This gets fantastic. Watch this. The process of that, resources of the sea, some have believed in recent days, years, that this may be referring to the abundance of the sea to oil. I don't know about that, but I, you do know that Israel now has some of the largest oil reserves uh, on earth right off its coast now, and also in the region of, of uh, Israel where... Um, the tribe of Asher once used to be. And what's interesting about that, the Bible says regarding Asher, that Asher, the son, he will dip his, it says in the Bible, it says he will, he will dip his toe in oil in, in the Old Testament. That's a weird thing to say. As the, as the prophetic words are given to uh, the tribes, to the children, and Asher, you will dip your feet, your toe in oil. And lo and behold, Israel has found oil in what used to be the ancient realm of Asher. But uh, look, Israel has uh, what's a natural gas reserve that's been discovered that, that they're calling it Leviathan because it is so big. Israel, little tiny country, size of New Jersey, is a super, is an economic superpower in that part of the world. You know that? Now, and that's only going to increase. Yeah, there's days coming ahead, and if I stick true to my notes, we'll talk about the tribulation period where all of their prosperity and advancements are going to draw. They're going to become a point of nucleus. But Israel's going to forget God or, or not turn to God, and they're going to look to their prosperity, but all that's going to come crashing down. But that's, that's later on But for us to study. But it's remarkable to me. You look at verse 5 and it says that uh, they shall turn to you. The, the merchants shall turn to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The wealth of the nations will come to Israel. Again, this is yet future. But for those of us who have been to Israel, when you, when you get to Tel Aviv and you turn left and you go north, you drive through Herzliya. And you go up the coast on the Via Maris. It's, it's Pacific Coast Highway. You know we have one? They have the, they have the Mediterranean Coast Highway. The Via Maris, the, the way of the sea. And you drive, guess what? You're driving, you look out the window. Raytheon, Hewlett Packard, Apple. All of these research facilities in Israel. And you, you shouldn't be surprised. You know, how many of you have a Samsung or uh, iPhone? Anybody raise your hand? You have a Jewish phone. The guts of your phone, the inside of your phone, is, it's all circumcised. It's Jewish. You have a, it's, you have a, those are all kosher parts. It's amazing. Did you know that? Israel's moving away from the barcode. You know how we have the barcode? They've invented something so small that has a zillion times more data than the barcode, and it's, they can put it within a, a weave of a fiber inside the clothes or inside the item, inside the car, inside your shoe, inside your contact lens. It's freakish. The genius technologies is prospering them. And God says and there's going to be a day. Think about it. The merchants and the wealth of the Gentiles will flow into Israel someday. And I think in many ways... We're seeing hints of that. But the interesting thing to keep in mind is that before Isaiah 60 can happen, there must be a terrible time, as I referenced a moment ago, 
And that time is known as, in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, it's known as the time of Jacob's trouble. It says, alas, for the day is great. So church, right now, you and I are living in the 21st century. As I complete this verse, listen. Right now, Israel's starting to prosper, but there's a day coming. Alas, for that day is great, so that that there's none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. A remnant will be saved. Church, listen. Israel in all of its glory and all of its grandeur of today and all of its might, it's one of the most powerful armies on earth. It's going to play host to this man that we talked about a few weeks ago called the Antichrist. Three and a half years of his government with the Jews, it's all going to come crumbling down. And the Bible calls that a time of Jacob's trouble. It will be unlike anything ever on earth. Can you imagine? It's going to be worse than the Holocaust. Worse than the invasions of Israel. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, Jesus said, Then there shall be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, circle that in your Bible, that would be for the remnant of Israel, the believers. Matthew 24 is God speaking to his people. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. A remarkable thing. It's amazing. Look at verse 6. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all those of Sheba. Sheba is a region that is today for us Saudi Arabia. Shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. Interesting. And they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. Verse 6. Look at verse 7. All the flocks of Kedar. Uh, Kedar is Kuwait. The region of Kuwait today. By the way, Saddam Hussein said that he was a descendant of Kedar. Did you know that? Saddam Hussein. Remember that guy? Kuwait. The region of Kuwait. Shall be gathered uh, together to you. The rams of Neboim shall minister to you. And they shall ascend with acceptance on my altar. And I will glorify the house of of my glory. This is the millenni- This is a reference to the temple that will be in Jerusalem during the millennial age. It's amazing. But by the way, look back at verse 6. It says uh, that they shall come, they shall bring gold and incense. Some of your Bible translations, look carefully, have gold and frankincense. Usually when the Bible mentions incense, by the way, it is frankincense. Does that remind you of something at this time of the year? Gold, frankincense, and what? Myrrh. Notice that myrrh is not here. Myrrh is not appearing in Isaiah 60. Why? Because it has to do with the future. When Jesus came the first time, it was gold. They brought him gifts of gold, frankincense, and listen, gold speaks of his kingship. Frankincense speaks of his priesthood. And what does myrrh speak of? His death, his sacrifice. In the second coming, when he establishes his kingdom, the world will bring to him gold and frankincense because he will be king and he will be priest. He will not be the sacrifice. Why? There won't be a sacrifice because he did that 2,000 years ago. My dear Jewish friends tonight, listen. I know that when you read your scriptures You do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah because you say Jesus can't be because he was ill-treated, beaten, arrested, condemned, and killed. No Jewish Messiah would allow that to happen to himself. That's the argument of the Jew tonight. We will not follow a loser. He didn't even defend himself. And so you reject him. But it's your own scriptures that say that he will be rejected by the world, crucified. That God the Father will see the lamentation of his soul and be satisfied when he makes an atonement for sin. This one that was to be born in Bethlehem, Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Born of a virgin, Isaiah 7 14. All Jewish scriptures. Tonight, see, the Jew reads the Bible and not all of the Bible. Selected portions the rabbis will tell them to read. Not all of it. 
Why do they not read much of Isaiah? Because the rabbis don't want the people to read Isaiah. They'll find out that Jesus is the Messiah. Think of it. Most Jews do not know Proverbs 30 verse 4 that announces that the God of Israel has a son. (laughs) When you look at the scriptures, you just look for the verses that say he's mighty and he's going to deliver Israel. Yes. But you know what? He took care of business first, big business first. The big business first was to make atonement for our sins. Jesus Christ went to the cross as the suffering Messiah, the atoning sacrifice, according to the scriptures. When he comes back, oh yeah, yeah, he'll come back in vengeance and in power. Yes, but he first came as the Messiah to be sacrificed. Now he's going to come back as the Messiah, the conquering king. He's the same one. See, the Jews today say, we're waiting for the Messiah to come. We say, we're waiting for the Messiah to come back. Big difference. Big difference. But God's house will be reestablished. There'll be a millennial throne and there'll be a millennial temple in Jerusalem during that thousand year reign. Verse eight. And who are these who fly like a cloud and like doves to their roost. Surely the coastland shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish, you ought to circle this, Tarshish, will come first to bring your sons from afar. What's interesting about this, we'll pause right here for a second. Tarshish, not all scholars agree. Some uh, Some scholars say Tarshish is Spain. Some say, and I believe this understanding, Tarshish is the region of Great Britain because the, Tarsh, the ancient word uh, Tarshish is rooted to tin, to mining. Anybody know another name of Great, uh, what's it called? The UK or Great Britain? Do you know what Britain means? Tin or the land of tin. Britain. If you've, been, if you've ever been to Cornwall region of England, and that re- it's, it's tin. England exported tin to the world. What's the deal? It doesn't matter if it's Spain or England at this moment of our study. What it does mean is the West, the European West and beyond. So you might want to take note of that. It says that ships, that speaks of wealth, of Tarshish, will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them. It's interesting. To the name of the Lord your God, And to the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Verse 10, the sons of foreigners shall build up your walls, and their kings shall minister to you. For my wrath I struck you. This is God speaking to Israel. I, my wrath, God, struck you, Israel. But in my favor, I have had mercy on you. Isaiah chapter 43 answers verses 8 through 10. Listen to this. Isaiah 43 verse 3. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom. True or false? You know this. You ever watch uh, the Ten Commandments of Charlton Heston? There you go. Ethiopia and Sheba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored. This is God speaking to Israel. And I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you. In other words, people are going to die for Israel's preservation. Who said that? God said that. Wow. And people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. What nation on earth gets this kind of announcement? Israel only. Do you see that? Does that bless you? It blesses me. Because if God, I'm watching history unfold, and I live in the 21st century, and I can study back and see, wow, this I know. When Israel followed God, they were blessed and they prospered. When they forgot God and walked out on him and embraced paganism, they were, dis- they were destroyed in their prosperity. 
He always left a remnant to restart the nation. (laughs) They were never exterminated. How many times in your Bible do you read where there are those who said, basically, we're going to exterminate them? Pharaoh, he failed. Remember um, Haman? Failed. That's a great story, isn't it? Oh, I wish I... Oh, man. Anyway. Every time... Hitler... Every time you set out to destroy the Jew and erase them from the earth, God preserves them and then they multiply. Man, I wish we had more time. You know why Jews are all the, you know why bankers are mostly Jewish? This is not a joke. This, sounds like a joke, huh? There was a banker, he was a Jew. No, why are, why are many, why are such global financial uh, operations Jewish? Why are, the Jewish, why are the Jewish people so entrenched in uh, Hollywood, uh, the arts? Why are, they, why are they such notable craftsmen? Why are they renowned diamond cutters? In fact, some of us have been to Tiberias when Japanese, Chinese jets come and land with executives with bags of diamonds. They go to Tiberias and they wait there for hours on end as these master, world-renowned craftsmen cut diamonds in Tiberias. Most famous cut, uh, diamond cutter, cutters in the world. What's with that? Did you know that all of those... Accountants! Mathemat- what, do you know that all of these things, God, when every time God dispersed them to other parts of the world in their captivity, they were slaves. And when they were slaves, like Joseph, they learned banking and horticulture in their slavery. When they were in Egypt, the Egyptians kicked back and relaxed, and the Jews learned how to build houses. They learned how to farm. When they were taken captive in Germany, those that were not exterminated were made accountants. Oscar Schindler. And every... Medo-Persian, Babylonian... Roman, every time the Jew gets set free, they get set free with a skill. Listen, they used to be part of the slave market in in the Roman Empire to perform for the Caesars. They played the music. They did the skits. They did the acting. They moved to Hollywood. They make the movies. (laughs) Ask Spielberg. Isn't it amazing? This is what God does with his people. They follow him, they prosper, and they're blessed. They reject him, they lose. And God says, in the end, I'm going to bring them from all over the world in the last days back into their own land. Look at verse 11. Therefore your gates shall be open continually. This is the millennial temple. Write that down in your margin of your Bible. Verse 11. This is the temple during the thousand-year reign of Christ. The gates of Jerusalem and the temple will be opened. They shall not be shut day or night that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations or the Gentiles and their kings in procession. Wow. Absolutely amazing. Verse 12. For the nation and kingdom which will not serve you, this is during the millennium, shall perish. And those nations shall be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you. The cypress, the pine, and the box tree together. You know, Lebanon has always... Look at the history of Israel and Lebanon in the Old Testament. Remember King Hiram? When he heard that Solomon wanted to build a temple in Jerusalem, he said, hey, you know what? I mean, he didn't say this next part. I wonder if it was in his mind. Thinking, Don't build it with the toothpicks you guys have grown there in Israel. Let me send you some real trees. And Lebanon, look at, the, Le- look at this, the national flag of Lebanon. What's on the flag? Cedar. Cypress, cedar. Famous. They floated, by the way, those massive, massive trees down the Mediterranean. It's amazing. He says there that to beautify the place of my sanctuary, again, the millennial temple, and I will make the place of my feet glorious, God is saying. Wow. Um, Again, we don't have time. I'm really bummed. When it says the place of my feet glorious, there's uh, you and I think, well, that means the temple's going to have a nice floor. I'm sure it is. 
But to the Jewish mind, do you know what this means? It's awesome. We can't prove it. It's so romantic, though. It's incredible. That when, when they believed, the Jews believed, I actually believe this. It's just, I believe it. The Jews believed that when God created the physical universe, he, it had to start somewhere. The Jews believed that when God created the physical universe, it formed underneath his feet. So imagine that for a moment. The universe and the earth and everything he's spoken into existence. Well, if that's true, and the Jew romantically says that it happened beneath his feet, the Bible says, and it is true, that when you look at Jerusalem, he says, I've embossed my name in, on, on Jerusalem. Jerusalem which is amazing because when you look at an aerial view of Jerusalem, this is the, alpha, uh, the, the uh, alphabet of God's name. And the hills and the valley and the hills and the valley and the hills make God's name over Jerusalem from a satellite view. The Jews believed that when God created, it all formed under his feet. And that was his glory revealed. So this mention here, the place of my feet shall be glorious. They believed that this is God restoring the earth like he made it in the first place. If you, and you will read in Isaiah that when he restores, when Jesus comes back, the Bible says the, the needle, the desert, the cactus will bloom. He's going to restore the earth. Not Al Gore, not Al Gore, not Jerry Brown. <laughs> Jesus is going to do it. Thank God for that. And it says, listen to this, Verse 14, also the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bowing to you, and all those who despised you shall fall, that is, fall uh, prostrate, face down, on their face, at the soles of your feet, and they shall call you the city of the Lord, Zion, the Holy One of Israel. Isn't that awesome? Look at verses 15 to 22. God wants to restore you, my friend, and Israel's is God's example of blessing. If he can bless them, he can bless you. Verse 15 says, Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, so that no one went through you, in other words, avoided the land, I will make you an eternal excellence, a joy of many generations. Verse 16, this is the theme verse. You shall drink the milk of the Gentiles. That is the, that, this is an interesting word. It means comfort and prosperity of the Gentiles. And milk the breast of kings. I'll explain that in a moment because it's weird for us to hear that. You shall know that I am the Lord. I am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. The God who restores. What is this? When it says here that... Uh, and milk the breast of kings. What does that mean? It, it means this, that the good things, the milk speaks of the good things. Remember when God said, I'm going to send you to a land of milk and honey? It means the, of good things, abundant things, blessed things. And then when it says the breast of kings, this is the delight of kings. The delight of kings. And you say, that's kind of weird. It is weird for us. We don't talk or think like that. But as, as I've told you guys before, you need to remember this. If you read Genesis to Malachi and the Jewish mindset, skip the entire New Testament and then pick up and read Revelation. If you're Jewish, I encourage you to do that. Read Genesis to Malachi, skip the entire New Testament, and read the book of Revelation, and you'll get it. Did you know that? Everything mentioned in the book of Revelation has a, is pre-event, pre-spoken in the Old Testament. You know, Christians today who say, oh, I don't understand the book of Revelation. I, I know why. Because you've never read your Old Testament. You can't understand the book of Revelation without reading the Old Testament. It's Jewish. So regarding the milk and the breast of kings, comfort, the comfort and the delights, listen to this, Revelation 1.13 Love, uh, chapter 1, verse 13. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest. Does anybody have an Old King James Version Bible here tonight? Anybody? Old King James? What does it say for chest? It says paps, right? P-A-P-S. 
In the New King James, it says chest. In the Old King James, it's paps, P-A-P-S. You say, what is that? It means breast. You say, what, are you kidding me? Jesus, the Bible says, is walking through the midst of the seven lampstands and all of his glory. The seven lampstands represent the church. And it says across his paps is a golden band. The golden band speaks of his kingship and of his authority. The reason why it mentions in this feminine gender breast is because Jesus, the conquering king, the ruler, the mighty God in flesh, he also possesses the power to restore, to nurture, to comfort, and to put at rest. Isn't it amazing that the Jesus, the book of Revelation, for those who believe and trust in him, is a comforting Jesus? He's the one with the sword and the eyes of flame of fire, fire, the face that's bright like the sun, and all of his uh, glory. It looks like, the Bible says it looks like like his legs uh, are like brass. It's like they're burning from the fire. This is the conquering Jesus. He's coming back. And yet across his heart, across his, his chest, the Bible refers to him as having breasts that would comfort you. Now, it's symbolic speech, of course. It means that in his heart, he desires to comfort you. Why? Because he's the God of restoration. I have three minutes. We're going to finish this. Are you ready? (laughs) Get ready. The power of God provides. This is what it's talking about. He's 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 the restorer who provides. The comfort that comes from a breast to nurture and to Feed and to comfort. Listen to this. He's the Lord that restores your joy, the Bible says. Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Make this your prayer tonight, saint. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take, uh, take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. He's the Lord that restores your joy, my friend. Number two, he's the Lord that restores your favor. Deuteronomy 30, beginning at verse one. Now it came to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, (coughs) which I've set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, verse two, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice, According to all that I command you today and you and your children with all of your heart and with all of your soul that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity. Some of you need to hear this tonight. And have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. And if any of you are driven out to the furthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you. And from there he will bring you. Verse 5. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. He's a God that restores. Third, he's the Lord that restores your fellowship. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If there's a brother or sister that's fallen into sin and they've repented, restore him. Listen, if there's a wife that's gone wayward and she's repented and she comes back, husband, forgive her. No, I got to divorce her. No, you don't. Restoration's first. That goes both ways. He's the Lord that restores your hope. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. He's the Lord of hope. He's the restorer of hope. Next, he's the Lord that restores your liberty. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all 
sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's the Lord that restores your vision, Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. He's the Lord that restores your security. Zechariah 9, verse 12. Come back to the place of safety, all you prisoners who still have hope. I promise this very day that I will repay two blessings for each of your troubles. Wow. He's the Lord that restores your loss. Joel chapter 2, verse 25. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Listen, this is God's will for your soul. This is God's will for your life that you be restored, Christian. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. So pick it up quickly in verse 17 because we're going to end this chapter. We are going to do this chapter tonight. Instead of bronze, listen to his act of restoration. Instead of bronze, I bring you gold. Instead of iron, I will bring you silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. I will also make your officers peace and your magistrates righteousness. Verse 18, violence shall no longer be heard in your lands. Wouldn't that be awesome to have a politic that has that kind of influence? Neither wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Oh. Verse 19, the sun shall no longer be your light by day. So wait a minute, what is this? Nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light. And your God, your glory, verse 20, your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light. Very quick, church, listen, what is he talking about? Revelation chapter 21, verse 22. Revelation 21, 22. But I saw, John saw, no temple. He, he sees eternity. Listen to this. John sees the dwelling of God. I saw no temple there. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city, he's talking about the heavenly, eternal Jerusalem, the heavenly city called Jerusalem, not the one on earth. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Is that awesome? And the, look at verse chapter, uh, chapter 60, verse 20. And the days of your mourning shall be ended. Also, your people, uh, this is the national salvation of the remnant. This is the national salvation of the remnant of Israel. Shall be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. Don't tell the UN that. <laughs> the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. Wow. What this means is God wants, it's awesome. Right now it's kind of going along and we're watching things happen. But God says, when it, start, when it starts to happen, it's going to go quick. Listen, friend, let's pray tonight that God would be granted the opportunity to restore you. Right here, right now. You know what? It's late, but it's not too late. Father, we come to you tonight, and we ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that there are those of us here tonight that need restoration of the mind. Minds that are tormented vandalized minds that have been just pressured to the point of crushing. And tonight, the Lord would speak to you and say, let me restore you. There may be emotions here tonight of a life that has been dashed by disappointment, heartache, and brokenness. And the Lord says tonight, let me restore your heart. There may be an atheist here tonight 
and your atheism has raped you, has left you without answers, without hope, and you've despaired even of life itself. And the Lord is saying to you tonight, let me restore you by coming to Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, to trust Jesus, the one God has prophesied that would die on the cross for your sins, my friend. Trust in him tonight. Go to him, not in religion, but in a heartfelt cry. And let God restore you. Backslidden Christian, God's waiting to restore you. Weary saint, God is ready to restore you. Hi, this is Pastor Jack, and if you were blessed by the message, you can like it, and you can also receive more of our teaching by hitting the subscribe button. We'd love to bring you more of the Word of God. God bless you.